So pregnancy. This is a very broad topic. It's so broad that it has its own special name for its study, and that is obstetrics. Uh, so you should understand the fundamentals of pregnancy if you want to get any question right uh, that pertains to obstetrics on medical licensing examination. Uh, and so having a good grasp of the fundamentals is going to be very important. There are some questions that are just dead giveaways on the test, and these will be answered uh, on, on these fundamentals. And so uh, we're going to touch on that here. We're not going to be talking about a whole lot of physiology uh, here. We'll save that for subsequent sections. Uh, but uh, we're going to define pregnancy, talk about how we diagnose it very briefly. We'll talk about HCG, which is uh, an important lab test to diagnose or exclude pregnancy. And then we're going to spend a good bulk of time talking about how we date the pregnancy. You will get a question on this invariably on the USMLE on how to date the pregnancy, how to give a woman her due date, and then also the TPAL system. And the TPAL system is a shorthand means that obstetrician gynecologists will use uh, to describe a woman's obstetric history, be she pregnant or not. So pregnancy is defined as the state of having products of conception implanted in the uterus or elsewhere, be it normally or abnormally. Now this sounds like a very sterile term, products of conception. What does that mean? It's really just the union of a sperm and an egg and what results from that. So, you know, you have your blastocysts and all that stuff, ultimately implants and becomes a baby in most cases. Uh, however, products of conception can be all sorts of different things, as we're going to see here. Okay, so normally you have a sperm and an egg. They come together. They form the, the embryo, which then becomes the blastocyst, which then implants normally in the uterus, and we call that an intrauterine pregnancy, and that's what you want to see. If a woman becomes pregnant and she has a positive pregnancy test and then you do an ultrasound, you want to see an intrauterine pregnancy because that is healthy and normal. Okay, so an intrauterine pregnancy is the most common result of fertilization, and it is consistent with a viable childbirth. Now, in rare cases, you can have a childbirth that results from a tubal pregnancy. Um, that is rare, but that would be considered an ectopic pregnancy. An ectopic pregnancy is any pregnancy where implantation occurred somewhere other than the uterus, so in the tubes or in the adnexa. That is an ectopic pregnancy, a pregnancy that implants outside the uterus. Okay, Products of conception implanted outside the uterus. Now what is a molar pregnancy? A molar pregnancy is a totally different animal, so this is never viable. Ectopic pregnancy is usually not viable either, but in rare cases they are. Uh, molar pregnancy is never viable. This is due to abnormal products of conception typically from a genetic anomaly. There's something genetically wrong, and usually it has to do with how the egg was fertilized or the state of the egg. So sometimes you can have an absent egg, and then you get a sperm that uh, goes into the egg, and then the genetic material uh, doubles, uh, or it can double in a, uh, a, a normal egg. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways you can get a molar pregnancy. Typically, these molar pregnancies result in something called gestational trophoblastic disease. I already did a talk on that in the gynecology section. You can go back and look at that. Gestational trophoblastic disease is a problem for the woman, uh, and there's means to treat that. Uh, and so I talk about that elsewhere. You can go back and refer to that if you want to know more about molar pregnancies. Uh, but some women will present with all the symptoms of pregnancy, positive pregnancy tests, etc., and she is, in fact, carrying a molar pregnancy. How do women present with pregnancy? Typically, most commonly, a woman is going to come to you saying, I missed my period, I took a pregnancy test at home, one of those home pregnancy tests that you can get at the drugstore, very cheap, relatively accurate, and she tells you, I think I'm pregnant. Amenorrhea is the most common presentation of pregnancy, along with usually one of those positive pregnancy tests that the woman will take at home. Other signs of pregnancy include nausea, vomiting, which is really a symptom, breast tenderness and swelling, quickening, which is defined as fetal movement, 
Usually a woman is not going to say, oh gee, I feel something moving around in my belly. I think I might be pregnant. No, typically she will have noticed that she's missing her periods first before you get to the point of quickening, which is a few months into the pregnancy. Other things that you can get, bluish discoloration of the vagina and cervix. This is known as Chadwick sign. Usually occurs around four weeks after conception. Uh, or, sorry, four weeks after the last menstrual period. So two weeks after conception. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Softening and cyanosis of the cervix around four or five weeks uh, after last menstrual period. And then softening of the uterus. This is known as Leyden's sign. These things are not means that a woman is going to present with. I mean, how many women sit in front of a mirror and like, oh, look at my vagina and cervix are turning blue. It doesn't happen. But there are things you might notice on physical exam and uh, happen to pick up the pregnancy. This is really just here for, uh, for the purposes of describing some of the things that happen with pregnancy. The linea nigra, again, something that happens very late, but something that's important to know because you'll notice it on about three quarters of pregnant women around 20, 22 weeks uh, LMP, she will have uh, that linea nigra, which develops, and that's because the placenta itself makes melanocyte stimulating hormone, and she'll get that nice little midline uh, of, of darkened pigmentation across her abdomen. That's known as the linea nigra. Uh, telangiectasias and palmar erythema. Again, these are not ways that women are going to come to you and say, oh, gee, I got a linea nigra. I think I'm pregnant. No, they're going to come to you and they're going to say, I've missed my period. I took this home pregnancy test. I think I'm pregnant, doc. Do something about it. Okay, that's how she's going to show up. Maybe nausea, vomiting, and you know, she's been sick, uh, throwing up a lot recently. You might think in the back of your head, well, maybe she's pregnant. Okay, so... Uh, these are some of the ways that women may present, but amenorrhea, most common. So how do we diagnose it? Well, we already kind of talked about that. She's going to take the home pregnancy test, and then she comes to you and says, I had a positive pregnancy test. What do you do? You're going to get your own pregnancy test in the clinic. It's not going to be a urine pregnancy test. It's going to be a serum pregnancy test, which is much more accurate. Okay, uh, so a urine qualitative beta HCG, yeah, you can get that in the clinic, uh, and some doctors might go towards that, but a serum beta HCG is even better. So it depends on how you want to approach it. You can get a urine qualitative beta HCG, uh, or you can get a serum beta HCG. It's really up to you. Uh, one is cheaper than the other. One involves poking the woman, which some women really would rather you not do. Uh, so uh, urine qualitative beta HCG uh, could be considered the best initial test, but a serum beta HCG is even better. Uh, so a positive clinical HCG, note that I say clinical, so you don't jump to an ultrasound just because she says she has a positive pregnancy test at home. You're going to get a clinical HCG test, be it urine or serum. Then at that point, once that's positive and you've documented it, then you go ahead and get sonography. It can be transabdominal or transvaginal. It doesn't really matter. Uh, and you can then confirm pregnancy that way. And what you're going to be looking for is a gestational sac, hopefully in the uterus, but it can be elsewhere. Typically, a gestational sac can be located as early as five weeks from her last, missed, or her last menstrual period. Uh, now, remember that this is after her last menstrual period. And so when does she ovulate? Well, she ovulates at two weeks from her last menstrual period, assuming a 28-day cycle. So when is a woman usually going to know that she's pregnant? Well, we already said typically she knows she's pregnant when she misses her period and then maybe goes on and takes one of those home pregnancy tests. Well, by then, you're already at four weeks from your last menstrual period. Again, assuming a 28-day cycle. So the fact that it's five weeks from her last menstrual period doesn't mean it takes five weeks from the point where she knows she's pregnant. Really, one week after she will usually know she's pregnant, you'll be able to identify the gestational sac. 
Okay, now the exception to this, and we're going to go into more detail on this, the exception would be like if she did a, uh, a artificial insemination, for instance, in which she knows, okay, now I'm probably pregnant. Well, it's going to be several weeks after that. It would be uh, three weeks from that point at which she will then be able to see the gestational sac. Uh, because it's going to take time for the sperm to get to the egg, and then it's going to take about a week for the fertilized egg to get to the uterus, and then it's got to develop, and then the gestational sac develops. Okay, but for most women, when they come to you and say, I think I'm pregnant, you get a positive pregnancy test, she's going to be at least four weeks out from her last um, menstrual period, okay? Fetal heart motion can usually be visualized as early as six weeks from the last menstrual period. That's extraordinarily early when you really think about it. Um, so, but that's usually, okay? So just because you're at six weeks, you do an ultrasound and you don't see heart motion, doesn't mean that it's not a viable pregnancy, okay? That's really the earliest you could see it. All right, um, I think that's all I wanted to talk about there. Oh, and then, yeah, so this is fetal heart motion can be visualized. So you're not going to stick an ultrasound on her and listen and hear the, the fetal heart motion. That takes a while. That, that, that'll usually take uh, towards the end of the first trimester. So uh, this is, I'm saying that it can be visualized on the ultrasound. You can see the little flapping motion of the heart uh, as early as six weeks LMP. Uh, but it will take much longer uh, to be able to actually hear it. All right, so what is HCG? HCG can be all sorts of different things. Uh, it can give you a positive HCG, not just pregnancy. But if a woman comes to you and says, oh, I missed my period, and you get an HCG that's positive, she's probably pregnant. Okay, so this is what the HCG does over time. And you can see that... Uh, starting early on in pregnancy, it begins to increase, and this is in thousands here. Typically, this will be given as 10,000, 50,000, 100,000. It peaks around week 10 of pregnancy and then declines. And there's a normal range of beta HCG depending on how far along she is, because this is the normal pregnancy uh, curve, uh, the, the HCG curve for a normal pregnancy. And like I said, it peaks at about 10 weeks, and it's somewhere around 200,000 uh, value. Uh, and this is milli international units per milliliter. Don't worry about that. Okay, so you could be higher or you could be lower, and that could tell you some things. Now, normally, if you were to have a molar pregnancy, it's going to be higher. Uh, but it could also be that she has twins. If it's lower, it might be problematic too. Okay, so uh, there is this normal range and typically we like to see it in that range, but just because it's high or low doesn't mean there's necessarily anything wrong. So let's say that you get a quantitative HCG, which you would have to get by serum. You can't do that by urine. That's why serum is best. Uh, but let's say that you get the quantitative HCG and it comes back as low. Well, it could be a variety of things. Could be ectopic pregnancy, could be a threatened abortion, could be a missed abortion. Let's say it's high. Could be a multiple pregnancy. She may have twins or triplets. Could be a molar pregnancy. It could be some kind of cancer. But far and away, the most common reason for an abnormal HCG level is inaccurate dating. So you think she's six weeks along, but in fact, she's nine weeks along. Well, if you think she's six weeks along, but she's really nine weeks along, and you take your HCG level and you compare it to what should it should be for six weeks LMP, then yeah, it's going to come back high if she's really nine weeks along. So it's important to know how far along she is in her pregnancy in order to be able to tell if the HCG level is actually high or low. And the most common reason to have an abnormal HCG level is inaccurate dating. So if she comes back, has a quantitative HCG, comes back with an abnormal HCG level, the very first thing you want to do is make sure that her date is accurate. So how do we date pregnancy? 
The most common way that we date the pregnancy is based on her last menstrual period. So that's quite simple. You go to her and you ask her, when was your last day of bleeding? She gives you a date. Listen, I'm not a woman, obviously, uh, but it blows my mind how much women keep track of this stuff. I mean, I guess I would know, too, the last time I bled out an orifice of my body, but then again, that doesn't happen to me very often. No matter, women often know when the last time was that she bled. And you take that date, and that's considered her LMP. Now, conception will usually occur around two weeks LMP, maybe a few days after that. Okay, remember that she, about two weeks after her LMP, she will ovulate. Again, this is assuming 28-day cycles. Uh, and then you know, three, four, five days after, uh, up to three, four, five days after ovulation uh, is when uh, usually she will, uh, she will conceive. Okay. Implantation occurs about a week after conception. Seven, eight, nine days after conception, then you'll have implantation. It's only at that point where you'll start to get a positive pregnancy test. So let's say that she, let's say a woman comes to you and she had artificial insemination or her husband, uh, she and her husband tried to get pregnant and they had sex last night and then she went and took a positive, uh, she went and took a pregnancy test and it came back negative. And she says, why am I, I must not be pregnant. Well, maybe you are, but it just, hasn't implanted yet, and there's uh, there's no beta HCG around to give you a positive pregnancy test. So it takes time for this to happen. Okay, implantation occurs around one week after conception. So you're not even going to get a positive pregnancy test until at least a week after you conceived. Okay, so implantation occurs around three weeks LMP. The pregnant woman will often discover her pregnancy around four to five weeks after her LMP which is usually when she misses her normal period and those goes and takes that urine pregnancy test at home. Okay, so by the time a woman knows she's pregnant, it's usually around four or five weeks after her LMP. Okay, so this is important to know. Uh, a lot of people think when they say, when a woman says that she's 12 weeks pregnant, that it was 12 weeks ago that she conceived. And that is not the case. It was 12 weeks ago that she had her last period. It was probably around 10 weeks ago that she conceived. All right, so I want to lay that out there for you. That's very important. So if you have any questions on this, please, please, please ask me. And this, another important thing, caveat here, assuming a 28-day cycle. We'll talk about what we do with women with 21 or 35-day cycles in a little bit. The most accurate means of determining the due date is the first trimester ultrasound, not her LMP because she might not know that exactly. So the first trimester ultrasound is the most accurate means of determining the due date. Now, you want to know what an even better way is, but it doesn't apply to most women? Well, let's say that she had an artificial insemination. Well, that's a pretty darn good way of knowing when she conceived. Okay, so if, let's say this is a single woman that wants to have a baby, she goes into the office, has an artificial insemination, comes back three weeks later, and she's got a positive pregnancy test, we know pretty darn good when she, uh, when, when she conceived. Okay, we don't have to go by the LMP in that case. Okay, so this is from ovulation to implantation. So she ovulates. This is considered typically two weeks LMP. However, if she has a 35-day cycle, it's going to be three weeks LMP. If she has a 21-day cycle, it's going to be one week LMP. Okay, so uh, that can vary. So she ovulates, and then within a few days, uh, there'll be fertilization. And then you have all this development that goes on before implantation. Okay, so you don't just go from embryo, boom, implantation. You have fertilization typically up here in the tubes, and then you have all this development that goes on, uh, and then the blastocyst uh, will implant. And hopefully it implants in the uterus, but occasionally it implants elsewhere. Okay, so how do we date the pregnancy? This is going to assume a 28-day cycle. We use Nagel's rule. And... To apply Nagel's rule, it's quite simple. 
you take the date of the last menstruation, you subtract three months from that date, and then you add seven days. And then, of course, use common sense as to uh, whether or not you need to add a year. Obviously, if uh, her last menstruation was December 19th, 2016, then her next, uh, or her, uh, her due date is not going to be in 2016, it's going to be in 2017. Uh, likewise, if we're talking here about an LMP of January something, well, you're not going to be, uh, you're, you're not going to be in 2016, it's going to be in uh, 2017. So uh, whether or not to add or subtract a year, uh, just use common sense for that, okay? So let's say December 19th, 2016 was her last menstruation. You're going to subtract three months, add seven days. And in this case, we need to add a year because we're going into the new year, right? And we have a date of September 26, 2017. And this is a rough estimate. Uh, now, like I said, if you're dealing with January here, um, then you're not going to add a year. Okay, I, I shouldn't have to tell you, you know, it's January to March, then you don't add a year, February... April to December, then you do add a year. This should be common sense to you, okay? Your due date is not going to be before your... <laughs> your due date is not going to be before your uh, LMP, all right? It's not going to be 20 months after your LMP, okay? So subtract three months, add seven days, and you get your rough due date. Now, the caveat here is that this is a tw assuming a 28-day cycle, okay? So what does this mean? So a 28-day cycle means that you have 14 days in the follicular phase and 14 days in the luteal phase. Uh, the dividing point is ovulation. And uh, what we know is that women have all sorts of different cycles. So some women have 32-day cycles, some women have 25-day cycles. Varies from woman to woman. What varies, though, is the follicular phase. So that time between when she finishes menstruation, and when she ovulates. That's the follicular phase. And it's the follicular phase that varies. The luteal phase, which is when you have ovulation and the corpus luteum then uh, is secreting progesterone and then ultimately involutes if she doesn't become pregnant, that is fixed and constant. It's around 14 days, no matter the woman. Okay, so the follicular phase may vary the luteal phase is around 14 days in everybody. Okay, so uh, let's say that, uh, okay, so, so the date of ovulation is going to vary, okay, based on her last menstruation. If she has a 28-day cycle, her ovulation should occur about 14 days after her last menstruation. If she has a 21-day cycle, it'll occur about 7 days after, and if she has a 35-day cycle, it'll be around 21 days, because remember, the luteal phase is always about 14 days. Now, let's say that you have a woman who comes to you, and she says that her last menstrual uh, period, her last day of bleeding, was uh, 6 weeks ago. Well, if you assume that, then you're going to have different, uh, you're, you're going to have a different result if you apply Nagel's rule depending on her cycle. Okay, so let's say that she comes to you and she's about six weeks, uh, then you're assuming that she ovulated two weeks after her, uh, her last day of bleeding, if you're applying Nagel's rule. But if in fact she has a 21 day cycle, then she became pregnant a lot earlier then you are assuming with Nagel's rule. Uh, and so, uh, in that case, her real due date is actually going to be earlier than Nagel's rule. Because look at this. Here she ovulates, this red line, and she becomes pregnant here. But if she has a 21-day cycle, she actually became pregnant earlier. And so her due date is actually going to be earlier than Nagel's rule would tell you. If she has a longer cycle, then she ovulated later then you would assume with Nagel's rule, then her last day of bleeding. Uh, and so your real due date is actually going to be later because she ovulated later than you're assuming with Nagel's rule. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. 
All right, so depending on her cycle, she ovulated at a different time. Okay, if, if she's got a 28-day cycle, she ovulates on day 14. If she has a 21-day cycle, she ovulates at day 7, seven days after her last day of bleeding. Okay, and that's going to impact how well you can apply Nagel's rule. So Nagel's rule assumes a 28-day cycle, but if she says she has a 23-day cycle, well, then you have, to, uh, you have to subtract five days from that due date. If she says she has a 35-day cycle, then you have to add seven days to that due date because she actually became pregnant later uh, than Nagel's rule would assume. All right, again, if you have questions here, please ask. I will answer them. I want to make sure I'm explaining this clearly enough. Okay, so some useful terms that are going to be handy for you uh, when we discuss pregnancy. So the first is pertaining to gravity. Gravity, not gravity with a T, but gravity with a D, is the state of being pregnant. So a gravida, a woman who's described as a gravida, is just a woman who is pregnant. You don't use that that often. A nulla gravida is a woman who has never been pregnant. Null coming from the Latin for zero, gravida coming from the Latin for pregnant, zero pregnant. Never been pregnant. Uh, so you'll hear gynecologists refer to a woman as a nulla gravid. That is a woman who has never been pregnant. A prima gravida is a woman who's only been pregnant once. So if a woman is described as a prima gravida, then you know that this is her first pregnancy uh, and she's never been pregnant before, or at least know she's been pregnant before. And a multi gravida is a woman who's had two or more pregnancies. Parity refers to uh, how many fetuses she's carried beyond the point of viability, which we generally assign 20 weeks is, uh, is viability. Uh, but usually it's more like 22 weeks. Um, but, and, and that's becoming earlier and earlier as medical technology improves. Uh, so parity is the number of pregnancies that she's had in which the fetus has reached the point of viability. A nullipara is a woman who has never completed a pregnancy beyond the stage of fetal viability. So you could, a woman could have become pregnant many, many times, but maybe she has 10 spontaneous abortions at nine weeks. She is still a nullipara. Okay, she's a multigravida, but she's a nullipara. Okay, so these terms are different. You can't use these interchangeably. Just because she's a multigravida doesn't mean she's a multipara. And then a prima para is a woman who has completed one pregnancy beyond the stage of fetal viability, and a multi para is a woman who has completed multiple pregnancies beyond the stage of fetal viability. A lot of times you'll hear doctors interchange multi gravida and multi para. And indeed, a lot of women who are multi gravida are also multi paras. But like I said, you could have a woman who's got fertility issues and she's become pregnant many, many, many times, but they always wind up in early spontaneous abortions, and she's actually never carried a pregnancy beyond fetal viability. In that case, she's a multigravida, but a nullipara. Okay, preterm typically refers to a pregnancy that has reached 20 weeks LMP, but before 37 weeks LMP. The definitions here can vary, okay, depending on where you're at, but uh, this is typically what's accepted in this country. Term is considered 37 weeks LMP to 42 weeks LMP, and post-term is considered 42 weeks LMP or longer, and that will be a relatively constant definition. Okay, so this GTPAL system, what is it? This is very important because you will see OBGYNs write this down a lot when describing a woman's obstetric history, uh, be she pregnant at the moment or not. And so you'll want to understand what this means when you see this, uh, when you see it written down either in practice or on a test. Okay, so the G stands for gravida. Okay, and we're going to talk about another system, the GPA system. I don't like that one as much, doesn't give you as much information, but the G remains the same whether you're using the GTPAL system or the GPA system. Okay, so G stands for gravida, just comes from the Latin word for pregnant. And it's the total number of known pregnancies she's had, including the current one, regardless of the outcome. So if she was pregnant uh, with twins and pregnant with two singletons, uh, then she's a G3 uh, because she's had three total known pregnancies. And now she could have 
10 spontaneous abortions. Let's say she has fertility issues. Uh, she's had 10 spontaneous abortions. Doesn't have any children, never carried any to term, never had any preterm deliveries, but she is in fact now a G10. She's been, she's known she's been pregnant 10 times. Okay, so it just stands for the total number of known pregnancies regardless of the outcome. Now let's say that she was pregnant with twins, and that's the only pregnancy she's ever had. Is she a G1 or a G2? Okay, well, how about you ask her, how many times have you been pregnant? And she has had twins. Is she going to tell you she's been pregnant twice because she delivered twins? No. She will tell you, I've only been pregnant once, I just happen to have twins. Multiple gestation only counts as one pregnancy. Okay, so if she had twins, and that's the only pregnancy she's ever had, she's still a G1. She's not a G2. T stands for the number of pregnancies that she's had that resulted in a term delivery. T stands for term. And term is considered after 37 weeks LMP. P stands for preterm, and it's the number of pregnancies that resulted in a preterm delivery. Preterm is really going to be considered anything between 20 and 37 weeks LMP. Uh, now, neither of these depend on whether or not the baby was born uh, alive. Okay, so she may have had a stillbirth uh, at 28 weeks. That's still considered a preterm delivery. It just so happened that the baby was born dead. She may have had a stillbirth at 39 weeks. That's still considered a term delivery, uh, even though the baby was born dead. Okay, so it has nothing to do with whether or not the baby was born uh, alive or not. It just ha happens to do with when she delivered. Now, A stands for abortus. And here we're not talking about when you hear the term abortion, you think, oh, that's when a woman goes in and electively decides to end her pregnancy. No. Abortion can mean, in OBGYN talk, can mean uh, either an elective abortion or a spontaneous abortion, uh, in which case she knew she was pregnant, or maybe she didn't, uh, but she had a, uh, she delivered this fetus before 20 weeks. So an ab it's only considered an abortion if it's before 20 weeks. So let's say that she delivers a fetus after 20 weeks, but it's dead. That's considered a stillbirth, okay? And that is not going to count under the A. That's going to count under the T or the P. So if she gave birth at 28 weeks, to a dead infant, that is considered under the P. That's a preterm delivery. If she gave birth to uh, her infant, fetus, whatever you want to call it, uh, at 16 weeks, that is considered a spontaneous abortion. Okay, so before 20 weeks is the only time you can count uh, it as an abortus. If it occurs after 20 weeks, it's either going to be a T or a P. And then L is the number of live infants born. So this doesn't have to do with the pregnancies. It has to do with the number of babies she's had live. Okay, so if she has only been pregnant once and she happened to have twins, she's a G1, but the L is going to be 2. Okay, in that case, she would be a G1 because she's only been pregnant once. Let's say she delivered those twins at term. She would be a T1. She'd never had any preterm deliveries, she'd be a P0. Never had any spontaneous or induced abortion, she'd be an A0. But the L would be 2, because she's delivered two live infants. Okay, so she would be a G1, T1, P0, A0, L2. Okay, so L is where we, you know, when we talk about, oh, well, she's had twins or triplets or whatever, we don't incorporate the fact that she had multiple gestation in the G, T, P, or A, but we do account for it in the L. Okay, we'll go over some examples of this to help you solidify this. Now this older system is uh, the GPA system, and I don't talk about abortus down here because we already sort of went over that, uh, but the G and A essentially have the same definitions. So the G, which stands for gravita, is the total number of known pregnancies she's had, including the current one, regardless of outcome. Same with the G TPAL system. P, however, is different in the GPA system. So this is where some confusion can come up. So P in the GPA system actually stands for para. 
Uh, and that is the total number of pregnancies that she's had that led to a birth of an infant after 20 weeks LMP or greater than 500 grams. So the P in the GPA system is really a combination of the T and P in the TPAL system. And as usual, uh, a multiple gestation is considered one pregnancy. A stands for abortus, and that's going to have the same definition as before. Okay, so let's go over some examples. Uh, well, let's do one here. Uh, a, uh, so a woman is on her fourth pregnancy. In the past, she has uh, delivered one live singleton at 40 weeks, one live singleton at 35 weeks and five days, and one live set of twins. I put 34 and seven here. You can consider that 35 weeks. Okay, same thing. Okay, so what would she be? Well, she's on her fourth pregnancy, so she is a G4. It's her fourth known pregnancy. Uh, so what about T? How many term deliveries has she had? Well, 37 weeks is term, so she's had one delivery at term. Uh, the other two happen to be preterm. They were before 37 weeks. Okay, so here we have a T of 1, a P of 2, two deliveries preterm. We don't know of any spontaneous or induced abortion, so her A is zero, and the L is going to be the number of live infants that she's delivered, and that would be one with her first pregnancy, one with her second pregnancy, and two with her third pregnancy for a total of four. So she would be, uh, under the GTPAL system, she would be a G4. This is her fourth pregnancy. She'd be a T1. She had one pregnancy at term. Uh, P2, she had two pregnancies that ended preterm. Uh, and then an A0, no abortions, no uh, deliveries before 20 weeks. And an L4, she has had four live infants. So she would be a G4, 1, 2, 0, 4. How about under that GPA system? Well, she's been pregnant four times. And she's had three deliveries after 20 weeks. And so she would be 1, 2, 3. P3, G4, P3, A0, no spontaneous or induced abortions. Okay, so you can see here, this is where the confusion comes in. The P in the GPA system and the P in the TPAS system are different. They have different definitions. In the GPA system, it's para. In the TPAS system, it is preterm. So please, please, please know the difference. And I, again, I like this TPAS system better. You will probably, I can almost guarantee you they will use the TPAL system on the USMLE. But some of the older gynecologists will use the GPA system because this was what used to be used. Okay, so let's do some practice questions. Ashley is eight weeks pregnant. It's her first known pregnancy. So please pause here and do the GPA system and the TPAL system since you'll see both of them in practice. Okay, so pause it and then start it when you know uh, the answers. Okay, so under the TPAL system, well, she's been pregnant once. This one's quite easy. She's been pregnant once. She's never had any deliveries before that. And she doesn't have, obviously, any infants because it's her first pregnancy. So she's a G1, 0, 0, 0, 0. No term deliveries, no preterm deliveries, no known abortions, and no living children at the moment, or no uh, live infants. Uh, so G1, 0, 0, 0, 0. And with the GPA system, she's a G1, she's a P0, and an A0. Okay, this one's pretty straightforward. Now, I'll just add, some people think that the L, the living, stands for the number of living children that she has. No, it really doesn't. Um, I mean, you can correlate to that, but the L, it stands for the number of babies she's given birth to that were alive, that were alive when, she, when, when they came out. Okay, so if she has... Uh, had three live deliveries, but one of those babies died of sudden infant death syndrome at six months of age. Well, it's still considered uh, under the L. Okay, so it's not the number of children that are living. Uh, it's uh, the number of live births. Okay, so now Ashley later gives birth to a live boy at 40 weeks gestation via spontaneous vaginal delivery. What is she now? Okay, you can pause it. 
Well, it really doesn't matter that she had it by, via spontaneous vaginal delivery. That does not get incorporated into this system. She is now a G1-1001. Okay, so she had her baby at 40 weeks gestation. That is considered term. Um, still no preterms, no abortuses, and it was a live birth. So G1, T1, P0, A0, L1. How about under the GPA system? Well, she's been pregnant once, she's given birth once, and uh, no abortuses. So it should be a G1, P1, A0. Okay, let's do a more complicated one. Susan has just given birth to a live girl at 32 weeks gestation via cesarean section. It was her first known pregnancy. Okay, what is she? She is a G1T0P1A0L1. So she's only had one known pregnancy. It was preterm, so it's T0 because it wasn't a term. P1, because this was preterm, no known abor abortions, and one live delivery. Okay, so uh, G1T0P1A0L1. Now, if she had happened to give him birth to live twins at 32 weeks, she would be a G1T0P1A0L2. Okay, it still would have been one preterm delivery, but it was two live infants that were born. Uh, she would be considered a G1P1A0 because she's had one known pregnancy, one uh, delivery, and no known abortions. Okay, now how does this get confused here? Brittany is 15 weeks pregnant. It is her third known pregnancy. Her first pregnancy resulted in a spontaneous vaginal delivery at 39 weeks. Her second pregnancy was a cesarean section at 40 weeks. So what is she? Well, she is on her third pregnancy, so she's a G3. She's had two term deliveries. They were both after 37 weeks, so she's a T2. No preterm deliveries, no abortions, and she's had two live infants that were born. So she is a G3 T2 P0 A0 L2 or a G3 2002. She is a G3 P2 A0 because she's had three pregnancies. She's had two deliveries, regardless of whether they're term or preterm, and no known abortions. Rebecca is 26 weeks pregnant. It's her fourth known pregnancy. Her first pregnancy ended in a spontaneous abortion at 10 weeks. The second resulted in a spontaneous vaginal delivery of live twin boys at 38 weeks. The third resulted in a spontaneous vaginal delivery of a live girl at 35 weeks. What is she? Well, she is on her fourth pregnancy, so she's a G4. She's a T1 because she's only had one delivery at term, and that was the live twin boys. She's a P1 because she has had a pre one preterm delivery at 35 weeks. She is an A1 because she's had one abortion, a spontaneous abortion at 10 weeks. And she's an L3 because she's given birth to three live infants, the twin boys and the live girls. So she's a G4-1113. What was she before she became pregnant this time? She was a G3-1113. Now, she is a G4P2A1 under the GPA system because she's had four pregnancies. She's had two total deliveries uh, that resulted in uh, a uh, delivery after 20 weeks. So that spontaneous abortion doesn't count as a P under the GPA system because it was before 20 weeks. Okay, and if you go back here, uh, go way back. It's, uh, P stands for the total number of pregnancies that led to a birth of an infant after 20 weeks. Okay, so in the TPAL system, P is preterm. In the GPA system, it's para. It's the number of pregnancies after 20 weeks or an infant greater than 500 grams. Okay. So uh, she is going to be a G4P2A1. Okay, that one delivery... Uh, that uh, really wasn't a delivery, it was a spontaneous abortion, counts as the A1, and then the two other deliveries are where you get your P2. 
She's a P1 under the TPAL system because that stands for preterm. She's a P2 under the GPA system because here it stands for para, number of deliveries after 20 weeks. Cynthia gave birth to a live girl at 39 weeks, live twin boys at 34 weeks, had a spontaneous abortion at 8 weeks, and then a live boy at 41 weeks. She is now pregnant. What is she? She is a G5, T2, P1, A1, L4. Okay, how do we get that? Well, how many times has she been pregnant? She had the live girl, she had the live twin boys, she had the spontaneous abortion, she had the live boy at 41 weeks, and now she's pregnant. One, two, three, four, five times. She's a G5. How many term deliveries? She had the live girl at 39 weeks and the live boy at 41 weeks. T2. How many preterm deliveries? Uh, the live twin boys at 34 weeks. That was preterm. Before 37 weeks. So that's a P1. How many abortions? The spontaneous abortion at 8 weeks. So she's an A1. And how many live infants has she had? The live girl the live twin boys, and the live boy at 41 weeks, that's four. So she is a G5-2114. Under the GPA system, still a G5. How many deliveries after 20 weeks? One, two, three, P3. And then how many abortions? One. So really when you're going from the TPAL system to the GPA system, you're really just combining your uh, T and P here. So you can see this just gives more detailed information. Okay, Aaron presents to your clinic and is confirmed to have had an intrauterine pregnancy via ultrasound. She says that her last day of bleeding was on July 9th, 2016. She has regular 28-day periods. She wants to know what her due date is. Okay, so what is her due date? So her date of last menstruation was... July 9th, 2016, we subtract three months, we add seven days, and we come out with April 16th. Well, what year do you think that's going to be in? It's not going to be in 2016, obviously. She's not going to be delivering her, barring any time travel or temporal spatial anomalies. She's not going to be delivering that baby in 2016. She's going to be delivering that baby in April of 2017. Okay. Again, just use your common sense. You'll see some rules thrown at you. Well, if it's born or if it's conceived between January and March, add a year. If or don't add a year. If it's eh, just use common sense. Okay. Alrighty.